Well, welcome back. We're here with chapter 15 from the Microbiology of Systems Approach by Marjorie Kelly Cowan and Heidi Smith. And this is like the main event. If you have been waiting all semester long to learn about immunity, then here it is. So we've been learning about the innate immune responses, but what happens when you get an infection and how do you develop immunity to the disease in the future? And so that is the thing that we are going to be exploring and how we get some natural or artificial immunity. What are some of the different methods of getting artificial immunity and how does that, and what are the concerns that people have about them? How, which ones work, which ones don't and why? And so hopefully we'll get into a lot of those questions, clear up some of the misconceptions that you may have about vaccines and their preparations. So without further ado, chapter 15. So in chapter 15, we're gonna look first at a kind of a review of chapter 14. So let's go back to a slide from chapter 14 that was at the very beginning of the chapter. And it shows again, just kind of an overview of the immune system. So you can see the host defenses are divided into the innate, non-specific, and the acquired specific immunity. And the first line of defense, you have the barriers. These are the physical and chemical and microbial barriers. Then you have the second line of defense, and these are the cells and the chemical systems that come into play immediately if they get past the surface barriers, the first line of defense. And so those barriers, if they get past the first line of defense barriers. And both of these are innate, you're born with them, and they are non-specific, which means that they are going to be something that does not depend on the particular antigen. You don't have to have been exposed to the antigen previously for this to be detected as foreign, and then you can fight it off. And so it's non-specific defenses. Then we have the acquired specific defenses, and that is the focus here of chapter 15 and this includes the specific host defenses that must be developed uniquely for each microbe through the action of specialized white blood cells. And boy, howdy, are there a lot of specialized white blood cells. In, and really these are the ones that are the lymphocytes. So anytime we say lymphocyte, you should remember this is a third line of defense. So the third line of defense, the B cells and T cells are primarily involved here and they do have the specific immunity, but you can see that there are some subsets of the T cells, the natural killer T and the gamma delta T cells. And uh, we're gonna be learning how they are sort of this bridge between the second and third line of defense as well. But they respond non-specifically, even though they are a lymphocyte. So they are kind of that, um, oh, black sheep, of the family and they don't do like, they don't work similar, they don't work the same as the B cells and the T cells, not exactly, but they, they are a lymphocyte lineage. And so they are part of this third line of defense, this acquired specific immunity. So here are some of the learning outcomes we're gonna look at, um, describe the third line of defense and how it's different from the other host defenses, list the four stages of the specific immune response the four major functions of the immune system markers, define a role of major histocompatibility complex and the three classes of MHC genes, compare and contrast the process of antigen recognition in B cells and T cells. It's a lot. But let's start with what is the acquired specific immunity. So this is the product of the B and the T lymphocytes. The lymphocytes undergo a selective process that specializes them for acting only for one on one specific antigen. So they only react to this one antigen or immunogen. And when we say something is immunocompetent, that means that it has the ability to respond to, to react with countless foreign substances. So it is able to react to an antigen. So what is an antigen? An antigen it, or immunogen is also the name for this because it produces or generates an immune response. And I really like to break these words down. So let's look at that real closely again. Immuno referring to the immune response and 
gens, which means that it generates or produces. So any chemical substance that can stimulate a response by B and T cells, so any chemical that can generate an immune response, that is an antigen. And so proteins or polysaccharides on or inside cells or viruses are typically what we're looking at. An antigen is usually protein, like protein is really dense, polysaccharides are really long, and so they have to be big. And they have to be foreign, and we're gonna talk about this later, but they have to be foreign to the body because if they're not foreign, our immune system has learned to tolerate them. And they have to be complex. So something that's just like repeating subunits typically is not going to be identified, even if it's really big, even if it's foreign, if it's very, if it's not complex, sometimes it doesn't produce a really good immune response. So any exposed or released protein or polysaccharide is a potential antigen. Um, and again, usually our own immune, our own antigens, our self antigens, as they are called, do not evoke an immune response. So they are not immunogenic. They are not an antigen. So the characteristics of the, the specific immunity, the, the two big things that are interesting, and I would say there's really like a third thing here, and that is spe they're specific, so specificity, they're highly specific to the antigen in, against which the third line of defense is directed. So they only attack or only respond to one particular antigen, and, and that antigen is probably just like four or five amino acids long if it's a protein. So it's a really small portion of the protein. It's not the whole protein that the, the immune cells are responding to. They are also, they are, there is this memory. And so there's a rapid mobilization of the lymphocytes that have been programmed to recall their first engagement with the in invader and rush to attack it again. And so the first time you, you your body responds to it very slowly, there is this lag time but the second time you have memory of the event. And so it is going to be very quickly acting and um, it is going to take it out. It's gonna take out that microbe before you even have any kind of symptoms, before it can spread. And so that is a beautiful thing. Um, the third thing I would say, and it's not in this list over here to the right that makes it special, but it's also learned. So you, it gets better over time you learn, the immune system learns, and it becomes better at defending your body against that particular antigen. So specificity, it's also very diverse. So there are a lot of different antigens out there. And our immune system, surprisingly, there's not any antigen out there that we can't respond to. So there's trillions of B cells and T cells, various types of B cells and T cells that our body can respond to pretty much any kind of antigen and it's inducible, so it can be turned on, it can be turned off, um, but it's inducible. Um, and clonality, so it produces clones, like attack of the clones from like Star Wars, and it's like making billions of these, well, not billions, but lots of cells that uh, when it's activated, it produces many copies, it proliferates, it makes many copies or clones, and those each will be present. Um, some of the memory cells then remain um, kind of waiting and seeing if this is going to rear its ugly head again. And they'll take it out as soon as it comes in. If, if it does rear its ugly head, the, the memory clones will take it out. And tolerance, it knows when to attack and when not to attack. So if it's a self-antigen, it does not attack. It tolerates that. And the memory, the memory is what gives us the immunity to disease. So I have a table that I have made, and this is this is my chart um, of the di or a diagram of how the immune response works. And the first stage is the antigen independent stage, which involves a time when the antigens have not been present yet; they have not encountered the antigen yet. And so in this particular stage, you have a stem cell here that is in the bone marrow and it d differentiates into immature B cells and immature T cells. And they're really small um, and you can't really, from, from a microscope perspective, if you're looking just through a, a light microscope, 
They're just barely bigger than a B cell or erythrocytes. Um, so B cells and T cells that are immature do not have any receptors, so they are not specific yet. And so I kind of think of this as they're born as a stem cell, a hematopoietic stem cell that can produce any kind of blood cell. And then they differentiate into the um, lymphoids, lymphoid stem cells, and then the lymphoid stem cells will go into the immature B and immature T. And that differentiation, um, then they go to different spaces. So like the B cells will stay in the bone marrow and the T cells will go to the thymus. And that actually the, B, the bone marrow is the bursa equivalent is what B originally was standing for, which meant the bursa is a, a, a structure in chickens where they first discovered the B cells. And the thymus is where the T cells mature. And so the B cells are in the bone marrow, which begins with B, and the T cells are going to mature in the thymus. So they, they're born, all of them, in the bone marrow, but then when they go to these different spaces, the immature B will differentiate, will mature, and get its receptors, B cell receptors, in the bone marrow. And it's sort of like going to college in, in town, so staying in town to go to college and get your diploma. Where T cells will go out of town, they go to a, a way to school, and they go to the thymus, and that is where they get their receptors. And so the B cell receptors that you can see here, they look like a Y shape, are either IgD or IgM antibodies, and they're um, stuck to the surface. And that's mainly where we see IgD antibody, antibodies. They're not really uh, released often. They're usually uh, attached to the cell surface and they're not secreted. Uh, IgM will be secreted, but the IgD, uh, as in dog antibodies, will stay on the surface. The, and they look like a little Y-shaped structure. Now, this is way not drawn to, to shape or size uh, this is not drawn to scale because um, these Y-shaped structures would be really microscopic. You, you really can't see them when you look at them under the microscope. So if you were looking for a B cell, a B cell and looking for those little Y shapes, you're not going to find that um, because they're, they're really too small to be seen. But for the purposes of this illustration, that's why I just put them on there so you can see that now they have their receptors. And T cells have... Um, two membrane, transmembrane proteins that it doesn't exactly look like uh, railroad tracks, but it has these little shapes like, it almost looks like the symbol for Wichita here. Um, the Wichita flag, you know, it's, it reminds me of that. But in any case, they have two membrane, transmembrane proteins that um, will receive the antigen and will then activate. So. Uh, the mature T cells go to the medulla area and the, corta the B cells will go to the cortical region. And actually they're really in a follicle. Um, so the follicular and um, the medulla area is more centralized and it's like interior to the cortical region. But we just call it the cortex, which is kind of like the outside and the medulla, sort of like the rind is the cortex of an orange, so cortex, medulla, the fleshy part is the medulla. And you see many organs like this. You see the kidneys are like this, and they also see, you see this in the spleen and the lymph node, and uh, the adrenal gland has an adrenal cortex, and then it has an med adrenal medulla. And so this is just kind of comparatively, so you can understand that it's more on the outside, the B cells are more on the outside, in a follicular region um, and are in the follicles and the medulla is kind of in the center of this and that's where the T cells hang out. So they're kind of at the center of the action. And this is where they're going to await activation. So the good thing is that once they get a job, they're always going to have that job. Uh, the sad thing is that if they never get the job, then they stay there and hang out in the lymph nodes forever and ever and ever. So once they get presented the antigen, this is the antigen dependent stages. Two, three, and four are the antigen dependent stages. Um, this is where they encounter the antigen. So the an antigen can be simple, um, soluble, and basically the B cells can actually respond to simple soluble antigen 
uh, that binds to the B cell receptors and it engulfs them by a process called capping. And that is how they get presented the antigen. They do not require an MHC complex to present the antigen to them. They can directly respond to the antigen. The complex antigen can be extracellular or intracellular, and they process or pre and present the antigens in the extracellular um, antigen. They get brought in phagocytosed, basically, by antigen-presenting cells, per professional antigen-presenting cells, such as macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. Yes, B cells, like these B cells, are also antigen-presenting cells. So the B cell itself can be activated by the antigen by itself without any help. But the T cells, they must be presented the antigen. And so this uh, antigen-presenting cells are three types of nonspecific immune cells that present the antigen, and they do so in an MHC2 molecule to a CD4 receptor. But they could also have an MHC1 complex on them because they are a self-cell. So the MHC molecules, MHC1, is the type of marker on all nucleated cells. And so because an antigen presenting cell is also an MH, is also a nucleated cell, they can both be presenting um, antigen on an MHC1 or an MHC2. But if they present the antigen on an MHC2, they are going to present it to a CD4 cell because only the MHC2 can present the antigen to a CD4 cell, a CD4 marker that's on a CD4 cell. And those are like the T helper cells. An intracellular antigen has to process and present the antigen. So it's already inside the cell. This would be like a virus typically, but it could be an intracellular bacteria cell or other something or other, um, an intracellular protozoan, for example, but something intracellular inside the cell. It has to process and present uh, the antigen and sometimes it's in the process of synthesis, like a virus goes through synthesis. When it synthesizes the antigen, it, um, there are pieces out there. And some of those pieces get caught up in an MHC1 molecule, and then they get presented to the surface. So they're kind of like sending up smoke signals saying, hey, we're infected here. Or you might think of a, a bank being robbed, and somebody goes to the window and says, help, help us. We're being robbed. Um, whatever that may be, the intracellular antigen presents the antigen in an MHC1. So now when immune cells see an MHC1, they usually ignore it. But if there's an MHC1 that's presenting antigen, that's a whole nother story. Then they know that it's something that you know, there's an infection. And they present the antigen to a CD8 cell, which is a killer cell, the cytotoxic T cell. And so this is going to be how the, the antigen is presented 